G'day everybody, where's Wally here? Well, it seems Mitchell, he's still not understanding the three steps that are required to do celestial navigation on a globe. Step one, you have to take a sighting. You seem to have that bit down, Pat. Step two, you have to look up the value of the distance to the GP of the target in the nautical almanac. And step three, you use trilateration to determine the location of the observer using the three or more distances to known positions of the GPs. Seems that last step Mitchell is still a little hazy on. I don't understand yet, Wally. So, Mitchell, you have to agree that all three steps are necessary, don't you? You're not going to get anywhere without them. If you want to successfully do celestial navigation, you must sight the angle to the target correctly with your corrections, you must look up the distance to the GP of the target in the nautical almanac for the time and date of the observation and the angle measured. You must use trilateration to obtain the observer's location from the known distances to the GPs cited in step one. It's super easy, barely an inconvenience, Mitchell. Oh, I forgot, if you want to do celestial navigation, you're gonna need a globe for that. Anyway, enough of that one. Let's have a quick listen to Mitchell today, his daily derp fest. You must have 90 degrees from your zenith to the surface. Perpendicular to the surface. Check. And it's also a 90, another 90 degree to the surface of the Earth from the GP. Two zenith lines. Check. And these vertical lines separated by some distance. Check again. And these vertical lines are parallel. Whoa, whoa on there, Mitchell, parallel to each other? Whoops, nope. That is not what we see in reality, is it, Mitchell? Now, I have shown, just recently, without a shadow of a doubt, two verticals, 281.91 kilometers apart, and they're diverging by 2.5979 degrees. I guess the baseline isn't that flat after all, is it, Mitchell? Thanks for yet another globe proof, mate. Finally, I saw this early this morning while I was watching the ISS and the Dragon was approaching to dock. Dragon and the International Space Station uh, with docking. And Cronus, a position inside of the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Mission Control Houston, maneuvers these cameras to get these views that we see now of Dragon, these high-definition views from a camera aboard the International Space Station. And this was taken out of Australia. What I find interesting here, Mitchell, is that there are two camera views, and there is parallax. So we could possibly work out the height of the ISS. Are you game? Well, we know the cameras can't be more than 100 metres apart. Otherwise, it's not on the ISS, is it? So we pick up the action here when the Dragon was at a waypoint zero, as they like to call it, which is 400 metres below the ISS. Here is a still with some nice features, and there's the latitude and longitude. It's minus 1729029, and... 133.144625. I think the black stump is just beyond it there. So I cropped out the bottom left image, put it over the top right image, rotated it, scaled it to match the camera's zoom level. And the dragon appears about the same, and the shadows match too. Spot on, Wally, good job. So doing a bit of pixel counting and checking the distances on Google, I figured out that the parallax was around 65 kilometers. Now, if you want to know exactly how I did that, drop me a line, and I'll tell you. The Dragon was around 400 metres below the ISS at waypoint zero, but I didn't know the spacing between the two cameras on the ISS. Bugger. So, let's just try a few. It's just ratios, after all. And 60 metres apart seems to be exactly about right for the camera spacing. So, I'm not going to make any claims here, Mitchell. No Bitcoins for me today. But boy, isn't this kind of cool, showing that you can measure the height of the ISS from the ISS. Thanks, Wally. You guys are awesome. What? It's a great time to not be a flat earther, hey, mate? You get it, Wally. So what do you reckon, Mitchell? Worth three Bitcoin? With a bit of work, maybe? Polish it up? Thanks for confirming that, Wally. 
you can see that earth curve right up there in the top left. Hey, that kind of settles everything, doesn't it? Well, I guess you're wondering, when am I going to make my claim to DIRTH? Aren't you, mate? Well, I have a problem. I'm trying to watch these daily Flat Earth videos each day, but I keep falling asleep. I'm flying over Australia, which you see behind it. You can see that the nose cone uh, is open. Uh, this opened about 15 minutes after liftoff yesterday, and uh, it actually remains open throughout Dragon's stay at the International Space Station. And we won't close this until uh, we are going to be uh, returning this vehicle to Earth. Um, it exposes a couple of um, different hardware underneath the nose cone that uh, is necessary for Dragon to dock. Uh, again, Courtney had mentioned, but these include the soft capture ring. This is what will make initial contact with the International Space Station, uh, sort of reel it in place and, and get the Dragon capsule and the International Space Station closer together for those 12 hard capture hooks to drive into place and, and form that nice tight connection. It also has um, the umbilicals, there are two of them, that uh, are used to power Dragon. Uh, the International Space Station um, it draws en uh, energy from the International Space Station. Uh, and then uh, underneath these as well are um, four forward bulkhead thrusters. There are Draco engines that uh, are used as part of Dragon's maneuvering um, throughout its, its journey. And we have confirmation that Dragon just passed waypoint zero and is now on its way to waypoint one, 220 meters in front of the International Space Station. And Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Approach zero has started and the trajectory has converged on waypoint one. Expect arrival at waypoint one at approximately 2308 UTC. For awareness, we do anticipate that there could be some Dragon Eye alerts while we are going through approach zero. These will have no action associated with them and we would still be go for approach and ground will take over uh, correcting any potential issues. I'll copy. And on the big loop endurance copies uh, good burn.